Good morning, church. Good morning. In our scripture reading in 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, <clears throat> the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the last of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This morning, my dear brethren, we're going to talk about that the big three of temptations. And as mentioned in this uh, particular verses, we have read the lust of the eyes, which is materialism, the uh, lust of the body, or lust of the flesh, which they call the hedonism, and the pride of life, or the egoism. But this morning, uh, this will be a, a series of lessons that we'll go through every week. And this morning, we will <clears throat> look into the first okay, major temptations of the devil to us that we give in to the uh, devil's temptation, and it will be the uh, of <clears throat> the eyes. So some a while ago, there's no amount of gold, there's no amount of silver that truly can satisfy man's craving. But only Jesus Christ can satisfy all of our cravings. They say that the eye is the window to the soul, which is actually true, uh, because it reveals one's innermost thoughts, one's innermost feelings. Okay. Now, somehow our eyes express our emotions. It tells us if that person is happy, it tells us if the person is sad or angry or even disgusted. Okay. Now, on the other hand, our eyes, they play a uh, significant role in sin. Now, <clears throat> our eyes, because our eyes is not only the window to the soul, but it also becomes a window of opportunity for the, for the devil to tempt us and commit a grave sin to God. You see, in general, the eyes, of course, sees and then as the eye sees, the brain would process what we see, and then we make decisions. So the devil is so cunning that he will use our eyes, that sense of seeing in us, and to turn this wonderful gift of seeing from the Lord, to turn it against us and to turn it against God, for us to commit a sin to the Lord. Then, with our eyes seeing the gold, for example, then it bore desire. Then desire, actually, is not inherently bad. They say that desires are bad. No. Desires by itself, it is not inherently bad. It is our evil desire that makes it bad. Now, in James chapter 1, verse 14, tells us temptation comes from our own desires. James was speaking about evil desires, not the good desires that we have. Okay? Now, the lust of the eyes, it is an evil desire, and it is an evil wanting to possess something that has a visual appeal. The visual appearance. Now, this loss of the eyes is referred to in the Bible as covetousness. And Miriam Webster Dictionary defined covetousness as marked by inordinate desire for wealth or possessions or for another's possessions. Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology defines it as a strong desire to have that which belongs to to another. Eaton's Bible Dictionary, a strong desire 
after the possession of worldly things. You see, by looking at those definitions, we can gauge that desire or covetousness is desiring another's possession. Okay? Desiring which doesn't belong to you. And by looking at all those definitions, <clears throat> we can see that covetousness is a grave sin and very much dangerous at that. Now, uh, the Eton's Bible Dictionary goes a step further by saying that covetousness or greed is not only desiring what others have, but also going after desiring worldly things. So therefore, covetousness or greed is not only desiring what you have, but also desiring what this world has that you don't have or that you don't have enough of. That you want more. See, covetousness is not only you don't have, you desire. Covetousness is about wanting more of what you have. You just don't get enough of it. So you want more and more and more. Now, so dangerous, in fact, that the uh, covetousness is mentioned in the uh, Ten Commandments. Actually, in the Tenth Commandment of the Lord. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet, covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So anything that you desire that doesn't belong to you is covetousness and it is against God. So again this morning we will focus on this particular uh, in the big three of the temptations particularly the last of the eyes. And we can see this and we have seen it in Genesis chapter 3 during the temptations of uh, Eve. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing or delightful to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So when God told them not to eat of this particular fruit, in the first place, they didn't have any desire for it. They don't have any inclination of going and even touching this particular fruit. The fruit didn't appeal to them at first. They followed God. But when the devil again mentioned and highlighted the fruit and showed it again to Eve, now this time, she had a better look at that fruit. Okay. Now, she, she probably put a lot of looking and thinking into that fruit. And then suddenly, the Bible tells us in, oh, sorry, in Genesis 3.16, that it becomes pleasing. Now it becomes delightful, pleasing to the eye. Okay. So what happened next was she took it and then gave it to Adam in the process. Now same with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 8. Okay, Matthew chapter 4 verse 8. Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now using the sense of seeing, the devil used that to turn it against Jesus Christ. He showed all the glory, all the wealth there is that the world has to offer and he offered it to Jesus Christ. Okay. Now 
What the devil wanted to convey to Jesus was the wealth that comes with power. The wealth that comes with authority. Now, the only difference between him and that of Jesus Christ is that, of course, Jesus Christ didn't give in to the temptations of the devil. While on the other hand, Eve gave in. And the devil used the visual images okay, to lure Eve and to lure Jesus Christ. But again, Jesus Christ did not give in to that temptation of the devil. Now, you see, even seasoned men of God, they fall prey to this kind of cunning scheme of the devil, this sin of covetousness. Even those that are been their faith has been so rooted up in Christ Jesus, they all failed at some point in their life. Now, when we talk of covetousness, the story of David comes to mind. The story of David with Bathsheba, the uh, the wife of Uriah, okay? the wife of Uriah, and another classic story about covetousness is about the story of Achan in the Old Testament. Now, having said that, we will look into the two general forms of covetousness in the Bible. Now, in the Bible, okay, covetousness, there's actually two forms of covetousness in the Bible. The first one is in the Greek word epitomeo which is the desire to last after, from epi, focus on, and thymos, passionate desire. So properly to show focus passion, as it aptly builds on epi, upon, what a person truly yearns for, to greatly desire to do or to have something, to long for, to desire very much. And the other form of covetousness is Is this term, pleonexia, advantage, covetousness. From pleon, numerically more, and exo to have. So properly to desire for more things, lasting for a greater number of temporal things that go beyond what God determines is eternally best, okay, beyond his preferred will. Now, for us to understand this, coveting is a desire. It is a last. Okay? They are all the same words used in the New Testament under the word epithemeo. Okay? This particular word. Okay? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the word desire is evil altogether, as I mentioned a while ago. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, just to give an example, if anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a good work. So the word desire is not all that bad. The word desire used in this particular verse is not in a negative sense, but in it, it is in the positive sense. So when you read the word desire in the Bible, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is bad. It depends on how it was used in the Bible. In Exodus Chapter 20, going back again to the commandment of the Lord. Exodus 20, verse 17. Now, we can see here the two general classification of covetousness. The Lord said, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Now, one thing that most people covet is, number one, material possessions. Material possessions. In 1 Timothy, we can read 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9 and 10. Those who want to be rich, however, fall into temptation and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. You see, people, they covet Number one, material possessions, material things, gold, okay. and
Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4, the Bible tells us, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Now be wise enough to restrain yourself. So we are forewarned that we must restrain ourselves for this kind of temptations by the devil. Because the lust of the eyes, they are so powerful. Even again, even if your faith is so deeply rooted, just like David, because of the eyes, he sinned against God. So never thought for one instance or for one moment that you can withstand the scheme of the devil. The Bible tells us, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Be wise. Be wise to restrain yourself from covetousness. Now, another classic example about uh, covetousness going after material things is the word uh, in Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, talking about epitomeo, which is lasting over material things. Joshua chapter 7, 20 to 21, this is the story of Achan. Achan replied to Joshua, it is true, I have sinned against the Lord and the God of Israel. So what is the sin of Achan? What was the sin of Achan? And this is what I said, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful cloth from Babylon, 200 silver shekels and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I, I coveted them and took them. You can see for yourself, they are concealed in the ground inside my tent with the money under the cloth. Because they were, they were told by the Lord that to not take everything or not take anything from the spoils of the war. But Achan, because of the glittering, the glitters of gold, the appearance of gold and the appearance of silver, sin against the Lord. And he took 200 shekels of silver, a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. He coveted those things. That's why he sinned against the Lord. And so he was punished by the Lord. He died for his, uh, for his sins of the Lord. Now, the other thing that the Exodus 20 verse 17 is telling us is he is talking about the second type of covetousness. And it is the sexual desires or what we call lust. If you will go over again in Exodus 20 verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. It talks about lust. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but we will not go into, into these details about the, uh, the sexual desires or lust of the flesh because we will have another topic for this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 4 and 5, each of you must know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And also in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2, and it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from, uh, from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So David lasted after Bathsheba when he saw her taking a bath. And I was thinking, probably that's why she was called Bathsheba, because she was taking a bath. Of course I'm wrong. Now, when the Ten Commandments were, were given, you see, sins are about actions. Okay? If you will look at the Ten Commandments, and if you will look at how God punished the people, okay, it is because of their actions. In order for you to sin against the Lord, you have to commit the crime. Okay? You have to commit the crime. The actual commission of what was forbidden. In the Old Testament. But when Jesus came under the New Testament and in our in the Christian dispensation today, Jesus Christ went a bit further. Okay? It is no longer the actual commission of what was forbidden, but rather the mere thought. The mere thought of it is already a sin. In Matthew 5 28, Jesus said, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman 
when the lust for her has as already committed adultery with her in his heart. In the Old Testament, you have to do the actual thing. But when Jesus came, he said that when you even look at the woman, you already committed adultery. And then the Bible called, calls greed as an idolatry. Okay. Greed is idolatry. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, we are told that therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. In the New Living Translation, it says, don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Now, the basic concept of idolatry is when we replace God from the seat of our hearts with something else. That is what is meant by idolatry. So therefore, the Bible puts it again a little further, stating that when you covet or covetousness, greedy, it is idolatry. It doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't only mean <clears throat> anymore that we bow down to a graven image or to a carved images to be an idolater. No. In the Old Testament, you have to bow down. You have to carve an image to be, uh, to be called an idolater. But in the New Testament, when you change or when you replace God from your heart, something else, and put that something else into your heart instead of God, the Bible calls it idolatry. Okay. It is when we replace God from the seat of our hearts with something else. Okay. Now, the amplified version of the Bible puts it this way. <clears throat> and greed, which is a kind of idolatry, because it replaces your devotion to God. So when you place, uh, when you replace something of your devotion to God, then that is equivalent to idolatry. Blaise Pascal once said, there is nothing so abominable in the eyes of God and of man as idolatry, whereby man render to the creature that honor which due only to the creator. You see, when we put anything on the pedestal in our hearts and in our minds other than God, we put a great mockery to God. We put a great mockery to the sovereignty of God because we elevate and we give honor to his creation rather than him being the creator that he is. Rather than giving all the glory, giving all the glory, uh, glory and honor to God and praising Him because He is our Creator. That's why, again, covetousness or greed is a grave sin to God. Dwight Moody, <clears throat> Dwight L. Moody once said, You don't have to go to hidden lands today to find false gods. America is full of them. Whatever you love more than God is your idol. You see, worldly things and worldly possessions are what humans are so greedy for. We go after them. Now, when you try to, for example, when you try to bribe someone, just for example, now the appearance of money, okay, the appearance of money and its visual allure to the person is so powerful that it can change that person's perspective. It can change that person's judgment to favor the person giving the bribe. See? Just like what happened to Eve. At first, when God told Eve, you are not to eat of the fruit of this particular tree, he, Eve was not interested at all. But when Satan, when the devil, no, he's so cunning, when the devil magnified to Eve that fruit, and to Eve, when he saw that again, when she saw that again, it was so pleasing and so delightful. 
But then again, it is only normal for us, my dear brethren and friends, it is normal for us to desire something and ask God for it. Right? It's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay? And God even said in <clears throat> Psalms 37 verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall, listen, give you the desires of your heart. So desiring something is not at all bad. God wants us to desire something. God wants us to ask something, and He will give that to you. But of course, if those things that we desire are against the will of God, then that is what is sinful. Okay. And look at the verse. There is a clause in that verse. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. If your desires are not what God, or are not what uh, within the principle of God, then you are not delighting in the Lord. You are delighting in your own desire, in your own evil desire. Now, for example, wealth. Wealth. All the possessions that we have. You see, it's a wonderful blessing, right? Wealth is a wonderful blessing when we use it for the furtherance of the gospel, for the furtherance of the glory of God. But when it becomes the center of our life, when you replace God with wealth in your heart, in your heart, then that becomes sinful. Another one, fame. Fame is not bad. Fame is not bad. Fame can be your platform to, to advocate beautiful things. Charity. You can use your fame to draw funds to help those that are in need. You can use your fame to raise funds to full funds to give out to those that are needy. Fame is not at all bad. Okay? But when you use your fame to just to focus on yourself, then it becomes your idol. Another one, power and authority. They are not all bad. They are not bad. Okay? You can use them to promote equality. You can use them to promote justice. And you can, you can use them if you are in the government, you can use your power, you can use your authority to advance the gospel. And I have seen many people in authority. I have seen many people in power who abuse their power and authority to advance the gospel. It is not at all bad. But the problem is, if you suppress justice, if you use your power and authority to corrupt yourself, then it becomes sinful. You see, desire is not at all bad. It all depends on how you use God's blessings that is in you. It is important to make God the core reason for all our desires. Now, I cannot have it both ways. You cannot have it both ways. The concept of servanthood is basically to follow our master, to follow Jesus Christ, to follow the commands and wishes of our master. That is the concept of servanthood. Now, if we say that we are a servant of God, that we are a servant of Christ, then we are to follow the commands and wishes of our master, Jesus Christ. Now, in Christianity, here is a classic example. A classic example. In Christianity, Sunday, is a time for all Christians around the world to worship God. It is a command from the Lord, from our commander-in-chief, right? It is a command from God that all believers in the world come and worship Him as part of our obedience to Him. Now, if we cannot do this command by God simply because of other things that we deem important, now, the question we have to answer is, where do we put God then? Where do we put God? Okay. 
Is there anything more important than God to us? Uh, that's the question that we all have to answer. Is there anything God has not given you that is more important than Him? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and you hate the other, or you hate one and you love the other. Okay? You cannot serve both God and money. Now, this I want to do. Okay, let's fill in the blank. You can serve both God and blank. Now, put in the blank. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and work. You cannot serve both God and hobbies. <laughs> you see, you cannot have it both ways. The Lord is fair. You either serve me or you don't. You either love the other and you will hate the other. Now, if we excuse ourselves not to worship God because of work, and this is a classic example, then we have to ask ourselves, who gave us the blessing of work? Who gave you that work? And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth or wealthy. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. A classic example, a classic story, a true story. There was this one, one brother, and then he, he, he goes to the church and he asks for prayer because uh, he has no work. And he told the preacher, can you pray for me? So that God can give me work. And then so the congregation prayed for him. And so after two weeks, in two weeks, they found out that uh, God gave him work. And then the congregation was so happy. But unfortunately, for four months, five months, they didn't see him. But when he was when he had no work, he was always present in the fellowship. I will study Sunday. And then the preacher asked him, why are you not attending anymore the services? Why are you not worshiping God? Oh, I'm sorry. I have so much work to do. Okay. The blessings of God keeps me busy. And I have, not, I have no time because I'm still working. And then before five months, and then lo and behold, he was in the chapel. And then after a week, he went again to the minister and he asked the minister, can you pray for me again so that God will give me another word? And so they prayed again. Then God gave him another word. And then another, the same thing happened. After five, within five months, he never showed up. And then he realized, finally he realized, okay, the, the minister actually told him that you should change your behavior with the blessings of God. You should respect the blessings from God and you should honor God because of the blessings that he's given you. And then this, this person realized that he has to correct himself. So what he did, he told this uh, employer that I will not work on Sunday because I have an obligation to God, my obedience to God. And so the employer understood and then right now, that person is so blessed by God. He was so blessed by God because he's been faithful until now. You see, the question is, who gave us the blessing of work? It is God. Now, if we excuse ourselves not to worship God because we are tired and it is our time of rest every Sunday, then we have to ask ourselves, who gave us the blessing of rest? Psalms 127 verse 2 tells us, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants, the Lord grants his sleep to those he loves. 
You will have a good night's sleep. You will have a wonderful rest. Jesus is the Lord of rest. Okay. He is the source of rest. When we say that Sunday is our day off and we need to take that uh, much needed rest and neglect to worship God, actually that is counterintuitive. You know why? Because Jesus said, when you come to him, by worshiping him, you will find real rest. You see? If you want to find real rest, come to church. Come to church. Okay. Come to church. If we excuse ourselves not to worship God because it is the only time we have for ourselves, then we have to ask ourselves, who gave us this life? To enjoy it. Who gave you your life to enjoy it? It comes from God. Right? And there was a saying, not all that glitters are gold. Now, that idiom is indicative that visual representation can really deceive him. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you see, it doesn't mean that what we deem valuable is truly valuable indeed. Most often, the things we take for granted are the things that are likely to be valuable and to have lasting value, like God. Many people, they reject God. But God, of all things, is the more valuable and that we must go after God. And people, they go after those that leaders. But they don't last. But the word of God, it lasts forever. When we go after God, our life will last forever in eternity with him. Again, even seasoned men, they fall into the sin of covetousness. They all pray, you see, to the deceptiveness of the last of the eyes. If we have so many excuses, my dear brother, sisters, and friends, not to worship God and not to serve Him and not to give time to Him, okay, then I will leave all of us with this verse and somehow we must think this very carefully. And I want all of us to use our eyes, not to deceive us, but to use our eyes with what is the most important thing in life, to see what are the most important things in life? And what are those? Number one, God. For the heavens declare the glory of God. All the things that you see declares the sovereignty and declares the glory of God. Use your eyes to see God. Use your eyes to see what are the most important things in life. Again, all glitters are not of gold. Or... Um, I said it wrong. <laughs> Not all that glitters actually are gold. So use our eyes to, to see the beauty that God has created and pursue God and worship God with all our hearts and with all our minds. Then with a final thought, let me leave you with this. For what gives you the right to make such judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? What do we have that God hasn't given us? Nothing. And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? You see, my brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Again, let us use our eyes to see God. Okay? Now, I would like to appeal, visual, no? I would like to appeal to those who want to enjoy the fullness of God's blessing, especially heaven that which awaits us, his, his faithful servants, come, okay? come with an obedient heart, and may I invite you to accept the Lord today, for tomorrow may be too late, or for later, may be too late. Give yourself to God 
commit yourself to God in servitude to Him by repenting of your sins and being baptized, being immersed in water as it was commanded by God. You see, there is water here. There's water here. Okay. Come forward as we sing the song of invitation. So as we are singing the song of invitation, we will be waiting for you to make that wonderful and great decision in your life. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? God bless us all.